And so there I was stumbling in the dark in my fancy black suit. Not this one. Just in case the item I said is fancy. What is he talking about? But it is pitch dark. I cannot see a thing. Now, as I'm just beginning to, you know, to, to panic, and I hear it. Like barking, lots and lots of barking. I see this pack of dogs charging towards me amongst the reeds. And I freeze in those moments of frozen panic. I forget the South African, all powerful, all potent word of Futak. Don't despise the moments where sometimes it feels like you're being looked over. It could be at your work. It could be at your school. It could be even at your own home. Don't despise those moments. But do what Jesus Christ does. Study the word of God. Learn. Grow in wisdom. Because the moment will come when you will open your scroll in your life and say today is the day. In rhythm with God's call for your life. I think the same thing with my kids. You know, giving them a car may sound like a good thing but it may be deadly if I have not prepared them to be able to drive it effectively let's just pray Heavenly Father I thank you Lord God for your word I come to you in the name of Jesus Christ Lord and I am here Lord to confess and concede that I cannot deliver this word without your power and your anointing your Lord has led me to this word and I can only preach what you impress on my heart as the word for the time. Sanctify me, O God, as a pure vessel from which pure living water will flow. That will challenge us, that will change us, that will comfort us and set us on our way to being with you in this place of Jubilee. I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus. And everybody said, Amen. Hallelujah. And so it's good that we are starting out laughing and uh, Laughing is a very good thing, and I'm going to be telling you a story, and believe it, it's true, as I tell you, but it's, it's good sometimes to, to laugh at ourselves. But for me, it was a situation where it was a Pusa Thursday, and I'm not looking at vet students <laughs> about this Pusa. Who knows Pusa Thursday? <laughs> By show of hands, who's participated on Pusa Thursday? Show yourselves. Okay, all of you holier than thou, it's okay. So anyways, it's Pusa Thursday. Picture this, it is Pusa Thursday. I just finished a speaking engagement, and boy, did I rock the house. And the audience is showering me with praises. And at that moment, I'm feeling as though I'm, I'm the rock star of speaking. Naturally, I decide to celebrate in style. And so I go out for some drinks. This is where things as a big and they take a turn. You see, in my Pusa Thursday drunken stupor, I forgot to fill petrol in my car. Classic move. But it gets better. My phone battery decides to die on me. To top it all off, I forgot the charger at home. So there I was stuck on the N12 towards Germiston, right in the middle of the off-ramp. Now, I am not in a position to ask for help from sober people, especially when I'm inebriated. Inebriated, colloquially known as pelingan, or sloshed. So instead of flagging traffic like a responsible person, I decide to do you know, the drunk shuffle. And I walk off the road. You know, away from the prowling eyes of the JMPD and that type of stuff. So, I'm thinking, look, this is a solid plan. And you guys are like, yeah, tell me, that was smart of you. <laughs> and so, there I was, stumbling in the dark, in my fancy black suit. Not this one. Just in case, I tell me, I said it's fancy. What is he talking about? But... In, in, in the fancy black suit, thinking I'm the black James Bond or drunken master or something. 
And then I come across this knee-deep, grassy swamp among some leafy reeds, like the reeds that we see here. And wouldn't you know it, I end up wetting my pants, my blazer, my shoes, basically everything from the waist down. But it gets even better. You see, as I'm trying to find my way, I completely lose sight of the Caltex petrol station that I thought I could reach. It is pitch dark. I cannot see a thing. Now, as I'm just beginning to, to panic, and I hear it. Like barking, lots and lots of barking. I see this pack of dogs charging towards me amongst the reeds. And I freeze in those moments of frozen panic. I forget the South African, all-powerful, all-potent word of Futak. I completely forget to say that and the dogs keep charging but something inside of me says just shout and yell Sandy and lo and behold on the other side I hear yeah woman <laughs> like it's me Imina hey Sandy for Imina you know next thing Sandy he calls off the dogs and I proceed cautiously towards him. And I end up in this valley surrounded by mud, tin, and cardboard shacks. It's almost like a real life situation of survivor. It's not your real shacks, the shacks that are hidden, you can't even see them. Anyways, Sandile is just as baffled as I am. He's like wondering who the heck was I and what was I doing there? I'm also wondering, how did I get his name right? <laughs> so, I come up, I decide to come up with a genius plan. I suggest, and by the way, this weekend, one of the reasons I'm telling the story, this weekend we were in, we were away with a group of elders, and we were around a campfire. But anyways, so I, <laughs> I suggest we make a campfire. Because, you know, everything makes more sense. I learned it from my uncles. Everything makes more sense around a campfire. So, as we are sitting, you know, shivering from the cold and the shock, I start pondering on what to tell these guys. And as I'm pondering, and wing, it hits me. I'll pretend to be an undercover agent. I'm like, yeah, this will work. I've got the suit. You know, I look the part. What am I doing here? I'm an undercover agent. And so... <laughs> guys, it's a true story. So I pretend to be the, the undercover agent and I spin this tale of investigating the suffering of our people. I've been sent by very important people in politics to investigate. And of course, it's all a big fat lie. But in daughter must do what in daughter must do. And I was like, hey man, these guys, they actually buy my story. They believe me. They think I'm some, you know, political savior who's going to come back with the magic wand and alleviate poverty. Talk about being at the right place at the, at the wrong time. And when the sun rose, I bid farewell to my newfound fans. As I leave, they think that I'm the next big thing in politics. And so, in that story, as funny as it is, I did learn something very important. If you find yourself in trouble, just shout Sandeed. <laughs> <laughs> it might just help you. But you see, the thing is, when we look at us, when we engage and come to terms and contact with scripture, one of the things that we fully appreciate is that from the foundation of time, you know, the scripture tells us that humanity has been in pursuit of a savior. We have been in pursuit of a savior to alleviate poverty 
a savior to set captives free, a savior to heal us from our diseases, a savior to heal us from our mental illness, a savior to heal us from our brokenness, to heal us from our brokenness, our sinfulness, and to cure the world from things like death. And the more we search, the world has come up with a whole range of things. We've come up with entertainment, we have come up with wars, We've come up with all sorts of man-made idols. And anything outside Jesus Christ, it is equivalent to us crying out to a person like me, who's clearly not a political savior, thinking that whatever I said to you will come to fruition. In other words, I will liberate you from your poverty. And so when we place our faith in anything that the world gives to us, it is just as equivalent as the hope that those shack dwellers were dwelling, dwelling on. They were holding on to nothingness, on to hopelessness. And that's the truth even amongst us, that outside of Jesus Christ, we are utterly hopeless. And anything else, it just serves to delay and put at bay the inevitable that will eventually come and meet with us. And so... The title of this message, as you notice, is that I was in an odd place. And I do believe where we, when you get into this particular part of, of, of the book of Luke, it is critical for us to appreciate Jesus as a person, Jesus as God, Jesus as a savior. For us to fully be able to embrace and apply some of these principles in our lives. And so, as Yonga was saying, we're going to start with the encounter next week. This is still the encounter, but I would like to suggest this here is just an introduction to help us to see before Jesus starts doing all these things, how did he get here? Where did he come from? And so, if we're going to be reading, let's, we're going to read from Luke chapter 4, beginning from verses 14 to 21. And it says to us, and Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. Not in the power of the Spirit at tops. He returns in the power of the Spirit. By the way, the Bible does say this. It says, do not be drunk with wine, but be drunk in the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus Christ, he comes and he's also, and again, I said I was coming from an odd place. Jesus Christ comes from an odd place. My odd place, I was put there by drinking and it was a sinful disposition that landed me here but here Jesus Christ comes from an odd place inspired by the Holy Spirit itself and so he comes back to he comes back to Galilee and a report about him went out through all the surrounding country and he taught in their synagogues being glorified by by all he taught in their synagogues being glorified by all and then he came to Nazareth where he, he was brought up. And as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. And they say, it says, the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. And he unrolled the scroll. Okay, I'm going to try to, to multitask. I forgot about this mic. But now it's, uh, I thought I could do this thing. There was no technology, so they didn't have to, he didn't have to contend with the mic. So when he held the scroll, I thought, you know, he had, this is, this is a scroll, by the way, um, that me and the blenders made to obviously try and help us see what a scroll looked like at the time. Because they didn't have Bible programs, they didn't have phones, they didn't have laptops, they didn't have books, for that matter. The printing press had not come. This is all that they had. It was written. And if you wanted any part of this, you would have to copy it yourself. And there was no book that you can have. And so, but we see Jesus Christ opening the scroll and he turns to the place where it was written, as Sarah was reading earlier. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he says, he sat down and he told them, say, look, from today, this scripture here has been fulfilled in your hearing. And again, what is, um, what is jubilee? Jubilee, it means rejoicing. It means 
celebrating it, but ultimately it means the release, setting people free. It is the setting of people free. Whether you are a captive or a captive because you are a captive of war, we, you are defeated and then you, you are taken as captives of war, or you are captive because of debt. So if you are in debt, you would be released. And so I, I often think, and imagine even for us, imagine we would have Jubilee in South Africa. Wouldn't that be amazing? You'll take a housing bond on day, year 49, and then year 50, you go to Standard Bank and say, guys, release me and give me my, give me my house. And if they've taken and repossessed your house, you say, give me back my house. That's basically what Jubilee was like. That's what it was. You know, unfortunately, in our, is the, okay, I'm going to try, as Selo is trying to fix the, the mic for us, I'm going to, hopefully, can you hear me from the back? I'm still audible. So anyways, Jubilee was, it was set out of the Levitical law which was, again, one of the few things that were alluding to Jesus Christ. So we see Jesus Christ reading this passage, and he gets it, he's reading Isaiah 61 and 58, and he's basically saying, whatever Isaiah was saying, he was talking about me. When Isaiah has said, you know, the anointed one, I am the anointed one. That's what Christ is. Messiah, it means he, Jesus Christ, Christ equals anointed. So Christ, Jesus, had arrived, and he's inaugurating his ministry, and now he's here to say, I am going to speak and do my Father's will. But that's not the thing that I'm going to be focusing on today, because I do think the key part of all of the stuff that Jesus Christ does, the key to his, the, the success of his ministry is in what happens before we get to this point. So in other words, it says to us, and I'm going to focus on verses 14 a lot, because verses 14 says, and Jesus returned, you know, in the power of the Holy Spirit. In other words, he returned from somewhere. Where was he coming from? He was coming from a very odd place. He was coming from the wilderness. And what had driven Jesus Christ there? He was driven by the Holy Spirit. And so I've split this message into three parts. And it is these three parts, I do believe, gleaning from the life of Jesus Christ it is how God prepares us for anything significant that he's going to use us for. Number one, it is the obscure place. Number two, it is a devilish place. Number three, it is the dry place. And we're going to just address those three things and say, how do I come out of those specific places? And we learn looking at Jesus Christ. Now, when we look at Jesus Christ, we see the obscure place. Obscurity means hidden. It is out of sight. And obscurity, oftentimes, we are terrified of obscurity. In many places, people want to be recognized for certain things, and I need people to see. But you see, premature notoriety can be very damaging and destructive. You know, if you take any plant, and my kids have, been, have got a, an avocado tree, and it's growing inside the house. Currently, the seed is still in obscurity in a glass with water and all that kind of stuff. And it's starting to have shoots. If we take that tree and plant it outside now, it will die. It will not be able to endure the elements on the outside. And so, obscurity in and of itself is a key component of the ingredients God uses when he prepares us for his ministry. Now, I would also argue that all of us, in different ways, we hide. We live in obscurity, whether inspired by the Spirit or inspired by Satan. So in my case, I was inspired by alcohol to hide from Metro Police. <laughs> you know, so I was in self-imposed obscurity, hiding from the law. And the truth of the matter is, if you don't have Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you are in self-imposed self obscurity. Because you are hiding away from the righteousness of God. And so as the more you are aware of your sins, and, and most people say, I'm not going to go to church because I'm a sinner. It is because you, you, one, you feel condemned. And number two, you think, I can't come to those people to see my sins. And that may not just be your case. In certain cases, you are in obscurity because you're hiding your sin. Where you don't want people to see your sin. And at night you do funny things and so on. 
and you know that those things are are unrighteous, you know that those things are sinful, you know those things are grotesque, and everybody sitting here, just look around you and just think next to you what the person may be doing. <laughs> what is obscure? You can even ask them, what is the thing that we don't know? <laughs> but the truth is, we all have some stuff in many respects, you know, before we come to God, the things we don't want people to be in. But that's the bad obscurity. That's the obscurity that leads to treacherous parts. It's the obscurity that leads to very dangerous places, the same way I found myself. But I want to focus a lot though on the God-ordered obscurity. It's the one that God orders. You see, Jesus Christ, even when he was born, if you notice something, is that Herod wanted to kill all the young boys because he was threatened about what God would do through Jesus Christ. And what had to happen, Jesus had to be hidden. His parents had to change rules to try and avoid the soldiers of Herod from killing Jesus Christ. And so obscurity in there, it was an obscurity that was protecting the purposes of God. And even for us, that is, the same is true. That sometimes God does put us in obscure places to protect the things that he has for us. But then we see him in Luke 2, verses 42 we see Jesus Christ learning. We see him in the temple. He disappears from his parents for three days. Again, keep noticing the obscurity. His parents can't see him. He's obscure for three days. The three days alluding to the three days that Jesus Christ will one day die for us. One of the greatest things that was ever achieved was achieved in the obscurity of the grave for three days. That is when Jesus Christ died for you and I, and that is when he overcame the power of sin and death. He did it in obscurity. And we see at 12, he's baffling the theologians of his time. He's sitting in the temple, Jerusalem. Now, this is not Nazareth where he's born, because Nazareth is a small town. It is not a big city, but where, what was a big city was Jerusalem, which was the capital, it still is, the capital of Israel, and they would, his parents would make a pilgrimage every Passover to go and celebrate it there. And Jesus is found in the temple. He says, I'm doing the work of my father. And he's wise and he's growing in wisdom. And listen for us too. In obscurity, you learn. You grow in wisdom. You study the word of God. It also tells us, it says, when he came back to Nazareth, it tells us, it says, he went to the synagogue as was his custom. Telling us as well, that we, if we want to be like Jesus Christ and be used significantly in the kingdom of God, we must not despise the gathering of believers. Even if it means some of the things that God ultimately would use you for have not arrived, you are faithful. Whether it's kids ministry, whether it's welcoming people, whether it's just simply coming to church. It, it, that the only time you don't come to church is if I have a good excuse. But you make it a custom to prioritize church. You make it a custom to prioritize studying the word. It says Jesus grew in knowledge and grew in wisdom. And you may argue that, that King Jesus at 12 years old, he was ready to do his ministry. He was ready to step into his ministry. But what we see, it says he went with his parents and he submitted to them. Obscurity. In his obscurity, he submitted to his parents who were way less than he was. He was the same age as his father and way older than his mother. And yet he submitted to that mother that he was way younger. Okay, I don't want to over, overly confuse you here. But Jesus existed before he was born. We agree with that. He was there before the world was created. And so when he came and he became a young boy, effectively, while in the flesh he was a young boy, but while to, who he, he was both man, fully man, and fully God. And he had existed before his earthly body. And if there's anyone out of the kids who can say, I'm not going to submit, it, was, it, it, it should have been Jesus. Who said, Nazareth, what's happening in Nazareth? Nothing is as keepy and so on. But Jesus is submissive to his parents. And we don't hear anything about Jesus for 18 whole years. Years of obscurity. And if I, I want to leave you with just that understanding that don't despise obscurity. 
Don't despise the moments where sometimes it feels like you're being looked over. It could be at your work. It could be at your school. It could be even at your own home. Don't despise those moments. But do what Jesus Christ does. Study the word of God. Learn. Grow in wisdom. Because the moment will come when you will open your scroll in your life and say today is the day. In rhythm with God's call for your life. I think too many people do not like this thing of obscurity and so you have half-baked stuff. You can see this person is doing this thing but you're like, the competence is not there, the capacity is not there. It is because they are not cooked long enough to become mature, to become, be able to be effective in the place that God has called them to be. And we also find young people who get to fame too soon and suddenly they are overcome by drug addiction, drug abuse and all those kinds of things is because what has happened is they've grown beyond their capacity to endure because Abatla Langa in the oven for them to be prepared for the, t- for the actual eventuality of their success. Sometimes success too soon in anything it can be something that is catastrophic for you. I think the same thing with my kids. You know, giving them a car may sound like a good thing, but it may be deadly if I have not prepared them to be able to drive it effectively. And I think here we see Jesus Christ demonstrating to us how to deal with obscurity. The next thing I want to touch on is the other place, is the devilish place. The Holy Spirit takes Jesus Christ to a devilish place where Jesus Christ is tempted by the devil. And so, in this situation for me, my devilish place, when I saw those dogs, it was a really devilish place. And there's two things. There's a devilish place which is self-imposed. Again, for me, just being in an addictive situation, overly drinking, doing all sorts of things that are outside the will of God, you, I actually give Satan the powers to actually destroy my life. But I do believe there are certain situations where the devilish place, it is, it is brought about by you being driven by the Holy Spirit. You see, when you have to suffer for the gospel, when you have to preach the gospel amongst opposition, stand for righteousness amongst opposition, amongst devilish attacks, also do not despise that. Because the Bible says he was led into the wilderness to what? To be tempted. And the English word only has tempted only as it relates to being seduced into a sinful pattern or into doing something wrong. But you see, the Greek and its Hebrew surrogate, they have the implication not just of tempting, but it's also of proving, of like making sure this thing is fit for purpose. In other words, like for example, you know, when you take a car before you take it on the road, you take it for a roadworthy test. The roadworthy test is checking if this car would be able to stand and be able to drive with five people in it, will be able to drive at 100 kilometers per hour, it will be able to drive at 120 kilometers per hour, and that's the proving. That's what the same thing that P- Peter says in 1 Peter 1, he says, for, so that the proven genuineness of your faith, the proven genuineness, so it is a situation where Jesus Christ is in a space where he is being proven, but being prepared for the mission that is about to endure. And so he is led by the spirit to be tempted by the devil. And the devil begins to tempt him about with food, tempt him with kingdoms, and notice that the devil keeps tempting Jesus with the things that he will get. He tempts him with the things that he will get, but not now. In other words, he will get, but only through the cross. That's where his power is. And even for us, it's not about whether God will bless you with something. It is sometimes there's a process that God wants to take you through before he blesses you with something. And I often use marriage as a critical one for that, like sexual gratification. It is, it's like most of the time, all the problems start because we want it before time. We want it before it's the right time. And it leads to destruction. Because we are not willing to go through the cross first, we want to get it now. And with Jesus, he's, the kingdoms are his. But he had to go through the cross to win his bride. And the question is for us, are we willing to say, I am not going to yield to the devil's weaponry, even sometimes real attacks. 
Because I want the glory that Jesus Christ promises for me. Because the Bible says if we endure with him, we will reign with him. We will be glorified with him. And so the more we resist, the more we endure, even as Hebrews 12 tells us, we, there is a crown of glory that awaits us. But it's predicated on the fact that we do wait. And we do not receive things before it's time. The next thing, before I close, is this. Is that Jesus is in a dry place. And this dry place, I think, is more important than, in fact, all of the other places because it gives us a powerful truth that I do believe that as Christians, if we don't get this truth right, we can never be effective in the kingdom of God. And this is the truth. You see, it, he leaves him in a dry place. And Jesus has gone there for 40 days and 40 nights, nothing to eat. Again, the Holy Spirit has brought him there. And... He trusts God and is able to survive. Now, what is Jesus Christ teaching you and I about enduring through dry places? I do believe for some of you, you are in a dry place. For some of you, you're still going to go into a dry place. You know, the thing is, Jesus Christ, again, the same as, the, as last week's preach, we were talking about Axa asking God about saying, give me springs of living water is that actually what we do learn here is that anything, any dryness on the outside can do nothing to us if we are not dry on the inside. In other words, if the Holy Spirit is living inside of you, it doesn't matter what dry situation you go through because you will have rivers of living waters streaming out, overflowing out of you, even though objectively, in the physical sense, you are in a dry place. And so sometimes the Holy Spirit does drive us into a dry place to teach us dependence in the Holy Spirit. You see, if you get everything that you need, you'll always credit your job, you'll always credit your intellect, you'll always credit your bank balance, you'll always credit the people around you for all the stuff, for the way you are able to endure stuff. You know, say, okay, the reason I was able to pass at Verts, you know, is because that person came and he just gave me 50,000 rand. Sometimes God makes sure that nobody comes. Nobody comes because he doesn't want to share the glory with anybody else. And you need to be fully and wholly dependent on who God is. So that, so, that, so that the glory becomes God. And so you can look back and say, if God had not been there for me, I would have not been able to finish at Wirtz. I would have not been able to finish at UJ. And so sometimes that you can look back and be saying, thank you, Lord, for the dry place that you taught me dependence in you. That even when the temptations come and all the good foods that the kings lay at the table, I'm able to say no to that good food because I know what's good for me. It is what is inside of me. And then I have godliness with contentment because I live with the Holy Spirit. You see, springs of living water, Jesus Christ says it so beautifully in, in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. And he says, you know what, you should be asking me for water because the water I give, you will not get thirsty. It will be like springs of living water welling up from within you.